Hello and welcome to Talking Tolkien and the ninth part of Frodo's journey. In the last part, the Fellowship narrowly escaped Moria, though Gandalf the Grey fell from the bridge of khazad in battle with the Balrog of Morgoth. They looked about them. Northward, the dale ran up into a glen of shadows between two great arms of the mountains, above which three white peaks were shining. Calebdil, Fanuidol, Caradras, the mountains of Moria. At the head of the glen, a torrent flowed like a white lace over an endless ladder of short falls, and a mist of foam hung in the air about the mountain's feet. Less than a mile away, and a little below them, for they stood high upon the west side of the dale, there lay a mere. It was long and oval, shaped like a great spearhead thrust deep into the northern glen but its southern end was beyond the shadows under the sunlit sky. Yet its waters were dark, a deep blue like clear evening sky seen from a lamp-lit room. Its face was still and unruffled. About it lay a smooth sword, shelving down on all sides to its bare, unbroken rim. There lies the Miramir, deep Hesald Saran, said Gimli. The company now went down the road from the gates. It was rough and broken, fading to a winding track between heather and wind, that thrust amid the cracking stones. But still it could be seen that once long ago a great paved way had wound upwards from the lowlands to the dwarf kingdom. In places there were ruined works of stone beside the path, and mounds of green topped with slender birches, or fir trees sighing in the wind. An eastward bend led them hard by the sward of Miramir, and there not far from the roadside stood a single column broken at the top. That is Dorin's stone, cried Gimli. I cannot pass without turning aside for a moment to look at the wonder of the dale. Gimli ran down a long green slope. Frodo followed slowly, drawn by the still blue water in spite of hurt and weariness. Sam came up behind. Beside the standing stone, Gimli halted and looked up. It was cracked and weather-worn, and the faint runes upon its side could not be read. This pillar marks a spot where Durin first looked in the mirror mirror, said the dwarf. Let us look ourselves once ere we go. They stooped over the dark water. At first they could see nothing. Then suddenly they saw the forms of the encircling mountains mirrored in a profound blue. And the peaks were like plumes of white flame above them. Beyond there was a space of sky. There, like jewels sunk in the deep, shone glinting stars. Though sunlight was in the sky above. Of their own stooping forms, no shadow could be seen. Oh, Khaled Zaram, fair and wonderful, said Gimli. There lies the crown of Durin, till he wakes. Farewell. He bowed, and turned away and hastened back up the green sward to the road again. The road now turned south and went quickly downwards, running out from between the arms of the dale. Some way below the mere they came on a deep well of water, clear as crystal, from which a freshet fell over a stone lip and ran glistening and gurgling down a steep, rocky channel. Here is the spring from which the silver load rises, said Gimli. Do not drink of it, it is icy cold. Soon it becomes a swift river and it gathers water from many other mountain streams, said Aragorn. Our road leads beside it for many miles, for I shall take you by the road that Gandalf chose, and first I hope to come to the woods where the silver load flows into the great river, out yonder. They looked as he pointed, and before them they could see the stream leaping down to the trough of the valley, and then running on and away into the lower lands until it was lost in a golden haze. Here they rested. It was now nearly three hours after noon, and they had come only a few miles from the gates. Already the sun was westering. It 
was here that Aragorn inspected the wounds that Frodo and Sam had sustained in Moria. Sam's head was bandaged, and this is what Tolkien says about Frodo. There was a dark and blackened bruise on Frodo's right side and breast. Under the mail, there was a shirt of soft leather, but at one point the rings had driven through it into the flesh. Frodo's left side was also scored and bruised where he'd been hurled against the wall. While the others set the food ready, Aragorn bathed the hurts with water in which Athalas was steeped. A pungent fragrance filled the dell, and all those who stooped over the steaming water felt refreshed and strengthened. Soon Frodo felt the pain leave him, and his breath grew easy. Though he was stiff and sore to the touch for many days, Aragorn bound some soft pads of cloth at his side. Frodo had been protected from grievous injury by the mithril mail that he wore under his clothes, it was given to him by Bilbo, back in Rivendell. When they had eaten, the company got ready to go on again. They put out the fire and hid all traces of it. Then, climbing out of the dell, they took to the road again. They'd not gone far before the sun sank behind the westward heights and great shadows crept down the mountain sides. Dusk veiled their feet and mist rose in the hollows. Away in the east, the evening light lay pale upon the dim lands of distant plain and wood. Sam and Frodo, now feeling eased and greatly refreshed, were able to go on at a fair pace, and with only one brief halt, Aragorn led the company on for nearly three more hours. It was dark. Deep night had fallen. There were many clear stars, but the fast waning moon would not be seen till late. Gimli and Frodo were at the rear, walking softly and not speaking, listening for any sound upon the road behind. The night wind blew chill up the valley to meet them. Before them a wide grey shadow loomed, and they heard an endless rustle of leaves like poplars in the breeze. Lothlorien, cried Legolas. Lothlorien, we've come to the eaves of the golden wood. Alas that it is winter. Under the night the trees stood tall before them, arched over the road and the stream that ran suddenly beneath their spreading boughs. In the dim light of the stars their stems were grey, and their quivering leaves a hint of fallow gold. Lothlorien, said Aragorn. Glad I am to hear the wind in the trees. We're still little more than five leagues from the gates, but we can go no further. Here let us hope that the virtue of the elves will keep us tonight from the peril that comes behind. They had gone little more than a mile into the forest when they came upon another stream flowing down swiftly from the tree-clad slopes that climbed back westward towards the mountains. They heard it splashing over a fall away among the shadows on their right. Its dark, hurrying waters ran across the path before them and joined the silver load in a swirl of dim pools among the roots of trees. Here is Nimrodel, said Legolas. Of this stream the sylvan elves made many songs long ago, and still we sing them in the north, remembering the rainbow on its falls and the golden flowers that floated in its form. All is dark now and the bridge of Nimrodel is broken down. I will bathe my feet, for it is said that the water is healing to the weary. He went forward and climbed down the deep cloven bank and stepped into the stream. One by one they climbed down and followed Legolas. For a moment Frodo stood near the brink and let the water flow over his tired feet. It was cold but its touch was clean, and as he went on and it mounted to his knees, he felt that the stain of travel and all weariness was washed from his limbs. The company now turned aside from the path and went into the shadow of the deeper woods, westward along the mountain stream away from Silverload. Not far from the falls of Nimrodel, they found a cluster of trees, some of which overhung the stream. Their great grey trunks were of mighty girth, but their height could not be guessed. There was a sound of soft laughter over their heads, and then another clear voice spoke in an elven tongue. Frodo could understand little of what was said, but the speech that the sylvan folk east of the mountains used among themselves was unlike that of the West. Legolas looked up and answered in the same language. Who are they and what do they say? asked Merry. They're elves, said Sam. Yes, they are elves, said Legolas. And they say that you breathe so loud that they could shoot you in the dark. Sam hastily put his hand over his mouth. But they also say you need have no fear. They've been aware of us for a long while. They heard my voice across the Nimrodel and knew that I was one of their northern kindred and therefore they did not hinder our crossing. Now they bid me climb up with Frodo, for they seem to have had some tidings of him and of our journey. The others, they ask to wait a little, and to keep watch at the foot of the tree, until they've decided what is to be done. 
Out of the shadows a ladder was let down, it was made of rope, silver grey and glimmering in the dark, and though it looked slender it proved strong enough to bear many men. Legolas ran lightly up and Frodo followed slowly. Behind came Sam trying not to breathe loudly. The branches of the Malon tree grew out nearly straight from the trunk and then swept upward, but near the top the main stem divided into a crown of many boughs and among those they found that there had been built a wooden platform or flet as such things were called in those days. The elves called it a talon. It was reached by a round hole in the centre through which the ladder passed. When Frodo came at last up onto the flet he found Legolas seated with three other elves. They were clad in shadowy grey and could not be seen among the tree stems unless they moved suddenly. They stood up and one of them uncovered a small lamp that gave out a slender silver beam. He held it up looking at Frodo's face and Sam's. Then he shut off the light again and spoke words of welcome in his elven tongue. Frodo spoke haltingly in return. Frodo then spent the rest of the night with the company, resting high up in the Manon trees. Day came pale from the east. As the light grew it filtered through the yellow leaves of the Malorn, and it seemed to the hobbits that the early sun of a cool summer's morning was shining. Pale blue sky peeped among the moving branches. Looking through an opening on the south side of the flat, Frodo saw all of the valley of the Silver Lode lying like a sea of fallow gold, tossed gently in the breeze. The morning was still young and cold when the company set out again, guided now by the elf Haldir and his brother Rumil. They went back to the path that still went on the west side of the Silver Lode, and for some way they followed it southward. There were the prints of orc feet in the earth, but soon Haldir turned aside from the trees and halted on the bank of the river under the shadows. After some way Haldir threw a rope to an elf across the river which they used to cross to the other side. So we'll spirit ourselves across the silver load here as the rope's gone now. Now just to show you that I do try to find some hints about Frodo's route that he's left behind. If you look at the trunks of these two trees either side of the river you can see the remains of Brumil's rope that the company used to cross the river. So we are certainly following in Frodo's footsteps here. When at length the company was gathered on the east bank of the silver load, the elves untied the ropes and coiled two of them. Rumil, who had remained on the other side, drew back the last one, slung it on his shoulder, and with a wave of his hand went away, back to Nimrodel to keep watch. As soon as Frodo set foot upon the bank of silver load, a strange feeling had come over him, and it deepened as he walked on into the nave. It seemed to him that he'd stepped over a bridge of time into a corner of the elder days, and was now walking in a world that was no more. In Rivendell there was memory of ancient things, in Lorien the ancient things still lived on in the waking world. Evil had been seen and heard there, sorrow had been known. The elves feared and distrusted the world outside, wolves were howling on the woods borders, but on the land of Lorien no shadow lay. All that day the company marched on until they felt the cool evening come and heard the early night wind whispering among many leaves. Then they rested and slept without fear upon the ground. In the morning they went on again, walking without haste. At noon they halted, and Frodo was aware that they had passed out under the shining sun. Suddenly he heard the sound of many voices all around him. Frodo looked up and caught his breath. They were standing in an open space. To the left stood a great mound, covered with a sword of grass as green as springtime in the elder days. Upon it, as a double crown, grew two circles of trees. The outer had bark of snowy white and were leafless, but beautiful in their shapely nakedness. The inner were malorn trees of great height, still arrayed in pale gold. High amid the branches of a towering tree that stood in the centre of all, there gleamed a white flet. At the feet of the trees and all about the green hillsides the grass was studded, with small golden flowers shaped like stars. Among them, nodding on slender stalks, were other flowers, white and palest green. They glimmered as a mist amid the rich hue of the grass. Over all the sky was blue, and the sun of afternoon glowed upon the hill and cast long green shadows beneath the trees. Behold, you are come to Cairn Amaroth, said Haldir, but this is the heart of the ancient realm as it was long ago, and here is the mound of Amaroth, where in happier days his high house was built. Here we will stay a while and come to the city of Galadrim at dusk. So we'll leave Frodo here for now in what I think is the most peaceful spot in Middle-earth. 
And as a little bit of trivia for you, this is also the spot that Aragorn gave the Ring of Barahir to Arwen, who pledged herself to marry him, thereby renouncing her Elvis lineage. Finally, here is a quick look at the map for the only area we've covered in this chapter, showing the route from the Dimral Dale, past Miramir, and then across Nimrodel, and then to Cadin Amroth. In the next part, we'll be heading into Karas Gladborn, the city of Lothlorien, home to the mysterious Lady of the Wood. As ever, if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel, Talking Tolkien, tell your friends, tell your family, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next chapter of Frodo's Journey.